Hey scholars, good to be back with you and today I want to talk about Helmholtz resonators. Now if you're into audio or acoustics or things like that, uh, you'll see Helmholtz resonators absolutely everywhere, um, at least in approximate form. Now the good news is they're not a bad approximation for a lot of physical systems and the math is pretty easy, so it's a good thing to learn about. I was an automotive noise and vibration guy before I came here to Purdue and I used them all the time. Um, also, one other thing, I zoomed back a little bit today so you can see the, the, the glory that is my little office right here. Um, so let's talk about what Helmholtz had in mind when he, when he developed this resonator. I, I doubt he called it a Helmholtz resonator, but that's what we call it now. And the idea is imagine you have kind of a bottle. If you're a chemistry person, maybe that's a Florence flask. And it's got hard walls. And acoustically hard walls, you've got an interior volume of air there, and you've got this neck. Okay, the neck has a length, volume of air, we'll call that V, um, length, and we'll call that there. And there's an area there. Okay, now Helmholtz knew, as uh, pretty much everybody after Newton, um, that if you have a system, a mechanical system that has a spring and a mass, okay, so a spring constant K and a mass M. By the way, if you're not, if you're unfamiliar with sort of mechanical uh, graphical notation, anytime you see a line like that with those little lines on the back of it, it looks kind of like a comb, that's meant to be a, a, a massive, rigid boundary. So think of this thing here right here as a block of concrete. Okay, so we've got a block of concrete and a spring and a mass. So if I were to pull this mass up and let it go, it would sit there and oscillate. Okay, and that it will oscillate at its resonant frequency. And the uh, frequency in radians per second of that system is the square root of k over m. Right? And this is something, I don't know, Newton probably knew. Uh, it came from uh, calculus, and uh, Helmholtz tried to make the same kind of system, the same kind of argument. So what he decided was the air that lives inside that neck, that's the mass. It, it oscillates back and forth. It doesn't compress, it just moves back and forth because of the, uh, the varying pressure in here. But here's the thing. Does air weigh anything? It doesn't seem like it ought to, you know, I can just move my hands around. The, the, the air around me, it doesn't feel like it weighs anything. Well, here's the, if you take a cube of air, one meter, about that big, at sea level on a standard day, which is like 20 C, 70 F, um, a cube of air that big weighs 1.23 kilograms. So 1.23 kilograms is like two and a half pounds, pretty much. That means that much air weighs as much as something that's sitting around in my office. Uh, let's see, how about this, okay? For reasons that aren't important, I have a go-kart tire in my office and it's got a little metal rim in there, okay? And it weighs about a kilogram, all right? More or less, I mean, for the sake of this argument it does. That means a, cu a cube of air that big weighs as much as this, okay? If you want something a little more uh, closer to home, how about grabbing a book? Book weighs about 1.23 kilograms pretty much. If you get the right size, go check it out. But that's how much that much air weighs. So the air inside that neck actually weighs something. It actually has mass. Now, this is assumed not to move. It isn't flowing in and out of the two, of the, of the, the bottle here, but it does compress. Is air compressible? Sure, hang on. Again, for reasons that don't matter, I've got a bicycle pump in here. I did not bring it in here just for this video. It was here before. And it's got this little gauge on it, okay? So if I had a bicycle, if I actually could hook it up to the, the go-kart tire if I wanted to, I could pump this thing up and I would know how many, how many PSI or how many bar. This is calibrated in bars? Okay, I would have guessed uh, KPA, but whatever. Um, it's a calibrated pressure, gallon shows up on that gauge, 
air must be compressible. You can smash a bunch of air into a small space. Ask any scuba diver whether you can compress air into that little bottle that's on their back. If they couldn't, if scuba diving wouldn't work. So clearly air is compressible. Because it's compressible, air acts like that spring. So the volume of air in here is that, and the volume of air in the neck is that. Well, if I've got a mass and a spring, I have a resonator. Well, Helmholtz had a resonator. Okay, so here's how we're going to do this. Let me, uh, da, 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 I'll get rid of all this stuff. Here, we'll just try this again. Okay, so the expression in Hertz now, in Hertz, for Helmholtz resonator is C over 2 pi square root of A over V times L. Okay, C is the speed of sound. Okay, it's 343 meters per second at sea level. Okay, if you're not at sea level, it's different, it's lower. Okay, 2 and pi, okay, those are just numbers, 6.28, whatever. Okay, the area of that neck, okay, that's A. There's a sloppier version of that. Okay, there's the volume, that's V, and L is this number right here. So if you have all those, you can figure out the resonant frequency of a Helmholtz resonator. It seems awfully abstract. Maybe we should try this. Well, I have uh, an insultingly overpriced bottle of water uh, that I got from the machine out in the lobby. Did it for you. Um, I drank part of it. Okay, so water is up to about there. So that means this is open. That's the volume. And I've got this little neck here. That's pretty close to a neck. So this is not actually a bad approximation. Okay. Well, what I'm doing when I blow over the bottle is I've got turbulent flow going over the top of the bottle and it puts a wide range of, of, of acoustic frequencies into that volume. Well, it only likes to, to amplify one of them. That one. Let's see if I can do this again. Okay. That means if the volume went got bigger, if that number got bigger, that number would have to get smaller, right? So if this volume gets bigger, that frequency gets lower. Let's try it. Oh. All righty. Let you know, I've done a couple of takes of this. I'm getting full of water. <laughs> Guess where I'm going after the camera gets turned off. That's a lower frequency. Okay, that worked. Where else do we see them? Well, um, another approximation that you'll see if you get into musical instrument design, which I have, is if you look at a, a guitar body, an acoustic guitar body from the side, okay, that's a cutaway. There's the sound hole, that big round hole in the middle of it. There it is. Just imagine we just sawed the body in two the long way. There's all kinds of uh, papers out there in their literature where people are trying to figure out what would be the equivalent. Uh, length of that slug that, that we assume to move in and out. This actually works better than you'd think. And then the next thing people will try is they'll say, all right, that is the top. And the top of the, the guitar moves uh, back and forth a, li a little bit, not a lot. And it has stiffness, it has mass. So if you had ad added those, that extra term in there, you'd have a two degree of freedom model of an acoustic guitar. That actually works. Um, like I said, I used to do automotive noise and vibration, and one of the things you'll see, go, go to a car, ask the owner first, or if it's your car, it doesn't matter, but if it's somebody else's, you know, ask, and look at the air, the, the thing that brings the air into the engine, okay? Okay, air, go, air has to go into the engine, in, in the, the jargon, they call, sometimes they call that the dirty air inlet, 
and you'll see a, this tube is just incredibly convoluted. It's twisted, it's got stuff coming off of it, um, and you'll see if you go back here far enough, there's, thing, there's a thing called a mass airflow sensor, MAF. That's the thing that tells the computer how much air is going into the engine. But somewhere up here, you'll see something that looks like this. They're usually square. It doesn't go anywhere. Air is flowing through this tube to get to the engine, because the engine uses a lot of air. The engine's basically an air pump. Okay? And there's this thing. It doesn't go anywhere, but it's there. And people made room for it. There's not much room underneath the hood of most cars, but they made room for this, so it must be pretty important. What is that? Well, it's an acoustic resonator. It's designed to change the sound uh, that comes out the air inlet. It's designed to change the sound the engine makes. And then you could tune it to make it sound rougher if you've got a car that you want to sound rough, like a big sports car or something, like a Dodge Viper or a Corvette or something. It may be tuned to make the engine quieter if you've got a kind of car that we want to be quiet. Maybe a Mercedes or a Lexus or something. You don't want to sit there and listen to throttle valve noise on your brand new Mercedes, throttle body noise. You want it to be nice and quiet. So you'll see things like that there. Not everything is a Helmholtz resonator. You will see things that look like this. Okay, same thing. They don't go anywhere. That's called a J-tube resonator, and you'll see those. So go in, go to go find a car making wise decisions, go find a car, open the hood up, and start looking for this stuff. Unless it's a really old car, if it's a relatively new car, last 10 years maybe, you will start to see this stuff in there. Those are resonators, and the people who design these things treat at least that one like a Helmholtz resonator. This one actually gets treated a little differently, but it's the same idea. Air has mass, air has stiffness, therefore a volume of air must have a resonant frequency. I can use that resonant frequency to tune the sound of the intake of a car. So, there you have it. We know now what a Helmholtz resonator is, we know what it looks like, we know how the math works, and we have some examples. Hope that helps. I'll see you next time.